Hey, what's going on, everybody? Samuel Kim here, and today I wanted to talk to you about L&M Fine Jewelry. The L stands for Landy, the M stands for Michael, and the AM stands for their son, Carson, or as he jokingly says, it stands for Carson. Um, it's a family-owned jewelry company. It's your diamond destination. I know it's my destination. I went there to get my fiance's engagement ring. They took great care of me. Their customer service is amazing. They're very attentive to what you need and what you're looking for, and they know exactly how to get you that. And also, their communication is top notch they take great pride in taking good care of their customers they took great care of me and my fiance every time we went in there great smiles on all their faces they do a great job if you're in the missoula area, missoula area or even if you're in the state of montana you have to drive over to missoula come to lnm fine jewelry get that ring for that special person it's your diamond destination hey what's going on everybody samuel kim here and i'm back with another one today we have some great topics to talk about. There is a lot going on in college football, particularly at the G5 and at the FCS level. We're going to be talking a lot of G5 football, which has to do with FCS football, I think. Especially the Big Sky, Missouri Valley, CAA, some of those bitter, bigger, better conferences. SoCon, most definitely. If there is a G5 FCS merger... The FCS, you got to bring up the FCS and talking about G5. We're going to be talking about G5 football. We're going to be talking about the G5 Power 4 split. Got a topic about that. We're going to be talking about an Arkansas football player who committed, well, a baseball player who committed to play football at Arkansas, something we haven't seen in a little bit, or at least it hasn't been public knowledge in a little bit. Brandon Whedon is the last time I knew that happened. Now we got another baseball player doing it. Um, we're going to be looking at Sam Herter's early preseason top 10 early i'm sure it might change who knows it may not change it might be the same but his early top 10 preseason top 10 we'll look at that boise state's head coach making some headlines talking about um freshmen and nil and guys coming to get nil don't be coming around here looking for nil we're going to be talking about that um college football the new roster limits at college football Definitely interesting, has to do with the G5, has to do with the revenue structure that we talked about last week. We will expand on that when they talk about rosters. I, this is something I mentioned, I think, a month and a half ago. We'll talk about that. I'll get into that when I get into it. Missouri State is going to Conference USA, leaving the FCS. We will talk about that. I did not get any fan questions, any subscriber questions today, so we won't have any questions to answer, but I want to get really deep into these topics, so make sure you guys pay attention closely, hit the like, hit the subscribe button, make sure you leave me a comment down below of what you liked, what you didn't like, what are your thoughts about all of these topics that we're going to talk about today, and we will get straight into it. Okay, first things first. This is coming from Football Scoop, um, footballscoop.com. They cover college football a lot. Make sure you guys go check them out. But um, a group of five top 25 poll coming, voted by G5 head coaches. Now, this is something that is interesting. And they talk about in the article how this could potentially set the stage for what would be a G5 level of football to where they play their own playoff and they play their own um, playoff tournament. Um, this could set the stage for that. This will be a top 25 poll that I think is going to be in effect this season that the G5 head coaches is going to vote on. And let me just get into the article because they did a really good job of talking about what this would mean and what are the ramifications of a G5 poll and all of that. As college football continues to see seismic shifts in its national landscape, with one high-ranking official saying just last week, the real question is for one is for other conferences. If you're not in the Big Ten or SEC, what are you going to do? A coalition is forming among group of five personnel to have a dedicated poll for programs in these five leagues. Conference USA, the MAC, the Sun Belt the American Conference, and the Mountain West. The group of five conferences that don't make up the Power Four, um, they're talking about making a poll. Preliminary groundwork already is underway for the American Conference USA, Mid-American, the MAC, um, the Mountain West, and the Sunbelt Conferences to have an official group of five top 25 national poll with voting, op with voting open only to head coaches in those leagues. Independent programs, UConn and UMass, also will be included in the rankings, pushing the number of teams involved to be approximately 64. Now, I think this is very exciting. I think this actually came out before Missouri State was admitted to the C <gasps> Conference of USA, so that might make it 65 teams. But, you know, I think this is, like they said in the article, this is setting the preliminary groundwork for, for to have a dedicated poll for programs in those five leagues. Wait, 
That was the last thing. This is the pre-numbered garment already underway for the American. Yes, so they're already working towards making this a thing. I would hope that we get to see this this season to see what it would look like. Obviously, the college football playoff has expanded to 12 teams, making it possible for a group of five team to make that 12th spot. That is what it's dedicated for. The, the 12th spot, or I don't even know if it'll be the 12th spot, but there is a spot dedicated for a group of five team to make the college football playoff. The group of five team with the best record will make the college football playoff. That is exciting. But the problem with that and the problem that the G5C is the payout for making that is only about $2 million, which is not a lot of money. Um, I think they want a healthier share, but we don't have to get into that. I talked a lot about that last week. Uh, organizers of the prospective poll believe that a proprietary ranking for the G5 leagues with every head coach receiving a vote could spark greater interest in potential broadcasting deals and programming. For example, okay, they broke it down. If the number two team in the group of five is playing at the number six group of five team, that's going to attract more viewers, as it was told to Football Scoop. So basically, if you have a dedicated group of five poll, rather than having a, some might say SEC biased AP or college football playoff poll, if you see the number one group of five team is facing off against the, or even as they said in here, the number two group of five team is facing off against the number six group of five team, that might entice people to say, oh, this is a highly ranked matchup. This is what this is one that we need to tap into. I think it's very similar to the FCS poll. When you see highly ranked FCS teams in the FCS, in some of the media polls in the FCS, definitely the Hero Sports poll. I can't remember what else, the FCS stats poll. Um, when you see teams highly ranked in these polls and you see them about to face each other, just like the AP poll at the FBS level. You see the number one team on the AP poll about to play the number two team in the AP poll. At the FBS level, Power 5 level, you want to watch that game. This is the same. The group of five is trying to do the same exact thing. And this will entice, if they do decide to split out, this might be something that can give a show to those deals, those TV sponsors, sponsors in general, as to why this is a good business model. Um, while the top conference champion from outside the Power 4 Conferences is projected to earn a berth in the all-new expanded 12-team college football playoff. The payout for those teams is less than $2 million, and access remains a concern. While every G5 head coach will have a vote in the poll, their full ballots will not be publicly disclosed, disclosed each week. I think this is a great idea. I think this is a great idea because with this lawsuit coming down on the NCAA, that could see them pay upwards of like $2.5, I think it was billion dollars back to college athletes who didn't receive NIL. Um, I think the G5 is trying to set the stage for what college football could look like, what a G5 playoff could look like, what the landscape of college, they're trying to set the stage for what the landscape of college football could look like going forward. So with this G5 poll, this could, I mean, this could entice viewers, this could entice sponsors, this could entice everybody who pays attention to the G5. But my question always is, and will still continue to be, where do some of those upper tier FCS schools go if there is a G5 break off from the FBS level? If they're, I mean, they might still be considered an FBS school, but if they're playing two different playoff formats, like what does the regular season look like? What does that mean for FCS teams? What does that mean for the FCS TV deal? Would that, would the G5 then take the FCS's TV deal? Like I thought these changes wouldn't be going through until the college football playoff deal was done. And I think it's done in like 2030, 2031. But it seems like these changes are coming much faster than anybody else expected them to come. Um, I, I think these are astronomical changes in college football. I think there's a lot going on right now. Um, I think this poll is very necessary. Um, I, I think it's it, 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 it'll give fans an idea of what, like, how these teams are weighted and what to look for when you watch these games being played. Like, I'm, I'm excited. I'm super excited to see some of these games, you know? I'm super excited to see the poll. I'm super excited to see where teams fall out each year, each week. And also, I think it'll be very exciting to see, like, where teams are ranked in the power in the G5 poll as opposed to where they're ranked. And the, obviously, there's only going to be G5 teams being ranked. So a G5 team could be the number one G5 team, and they could be, like, the 20th ranked in the AP or college football playoff poll. I think that's going to be interesting to monitor to see where teams are ranked in the G5 poll as opposed to where they're ranked in the AP or college football playoff poll leading up to when the college football playoff poll takes it over for the season. Like, I think that's going to be interesting to monitor. Like, if they do do it this season, if that is the way they, like, obviously I don't think it'll hold a lot of weight other than G5 versus G5 matchups. Like, if you have an in-conference G5 matchup, that's where the poll, people are going to refer to that poll. But... I think where it'll hold the most weight is giving a reference point to where these coaches obviously think these G5 teams are ranked each week 
And I think it'll give a great comparison to where they're ranked in the G5 poll opposed to where they're ranked in the AP college football playoff poll. I think it'll be something really instrumental for this college football season. I think it'll give brand sponsorships, these leagues, a good idea of what they're able to work with in terms. I mean, they already get their viewership numbers, but um, I just think it'll give them understanding of what things will look like going forward if there were to be a split, which seems inevitable at this point. Um, you guys let me know what you guys think about that in the comments. Hope I gave you enough information. But um, yeah, this will be very exciting. Very exciting. Very, very exciting. Let me know in the comments what you think about that, and we will move on. Okay, Sonny Dykes, the head coach of TCU, predicts a future split among P4 and G5 schools. Alabama and LA Tech aren't playing the same sport. That's what Sonny Dyke said, who also was the former head coach of SMU. So he does know a little bit of what he's talking about when it comes to G5 football opposed to Power 4 football. He was at a G5 school at SMU. He went to TCU, took his team to the national championship. Obviously, they got beat down by Georgia, but nonetheless, he took a team to the G5 playoff, to the playoff. I think that might have been the first Big 12 team to make the championship. Maybe OU made it. OU might have made it and lost. But I think that might have been the first time a Big 12 team played in the championship. Not the playoff, because we know OU's made the playoff a couple of times, but they haven't made it to the championship. Obviously, Texas made it to the playoff this year, but they didn't make it to the championship either. So I think TCU might have been the first Big 12 team to play in the championship game. Still not a Big 12 team has won it, which... Is a problem. But anyway, Sonny Dykes knows a little bit of what he's talking about. He's seen the G5. He's seen the Power 4. What has been a slow and inching march to an, a new model, what had been a slow inching march to a new model of high-level college football has quickly become a seemingly inevitable and one in the not-too-distant future as TCU head coach Sonny Dykes sees things. And with the supposed Power 4 leagues, the SEC, Big 10, ACC, and Big 12, poised to move a model to move to a model where at least football players and likely other athletes are comp compensated like employees, coaches predict a split between the two trench tranches of leagues that comprise FBS football. Multiple coaches also shared this view with Dave Campbell's Texas Football in a recent story. There's got to be a split eventually, Sonny Dyke said to DTCF. DT, DCTF's Mike Craven. There is such a big difference right now between the haves and have nots, and I think we will eventually split into two separate divisions. Alabama and LA Tech aren't playing the same sport. So he's referring to Louisiana Tech, who I believe, I don't want to get this wrong, they either play in the Sun Belt or the American. Oh no, they play in Conference USA. Uh, LA Tech plays in Conference USA, and then Alabama obviously plays in the SEC. He's talking about how like those teams don't, even, they would never compete against each other. The resources aren't the same, and it, it's just the two different levels of football. Alabama, the SEC, that's like a step below professional football. Obviously, professional football is completely different. But Alabama, if any college level football was as close to NFL football, it would be Alabama. Like. That's that's the bar. Uh, not even Alabama, but just the SEC in general. The SEC, the Big Ten, they play really good football. But then you look at some of these G5 schools, and it's like, man, like they don't even look the same. I, I would say the G5s resemble the FCS more than they resemble the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Michigans, the Ohio States. I fully, fully believe that. LA Tech, I mean, LA Tech wouldn't even beat South Dakota State or North Dakota State or even a Montana or a Montana State. I believe that. LA Tech would not beat those schools. But if you put them on the same level, they compete against each other. But LA Tech is never going to compete against the SEC. They're never going to be able to compete against the Big 12. They, I mean, it's just not its just not the same. So I get what Sonny Dykes is saying from that level, from that standpoint. The current animating force that has college football hurtling toward employment status for players are the negotiations towards, an, a, settle, towards a settlement in the House versus NCAA lawsuit. The general gist is that a settlement, if agreed to by plaintiffs, defendants and signed off on by the judge would usher in, uh, in an employment model for at least high level college football. So referring to the power fours, if you watched my video last week, I, I, I referenced this. I talked about this a lot about how this $2.9 billion lawsuit, which is most likely going to be settled for less than that, um, is coming down the pike for the NCAA. And in response to that, we could see a revenue structure, which looks like teams in the power four having a revenue having a 
salary cap of about 20 to 30 million more likely close to like 18 to 22 million but somewhere in that range those teams could have a salary cap now i don't know how that money would be divvied up i don't know what that would look like for head coaches hiring general managers i don't know what that would, i don't know what that would look like but they've talked about shortening rosters less walk-on spots obviously the salary cap like there's a bunch of changes coming in we just saw the new change from the division one committee talking about how um, college athletic departments can be more closely involved in NIL. I think all of the changes that we're seeing in college football, I think, are leading us to this level of power four becoming basically uh, a professional league. I mean, say what you want. Like, I, I was going to call it semi-pro, but semi-pros don't even get paid like some of these guys are going to be getting paid at the college level, which is deserved. There's a lot of money being made at col for college football. These players deserve a piece of the pie. But what is that going to look like? Sucks for some of these uh walk-on spots that are going to be lessened at this point but i digress these jobs are even harder now because if one of your players has a great season he's probably getting plucked away dyke said your only chance is to build a great culture and hope that keeps most of your roster intact he's referring yes to the g5 but this refers directly to the fcs as well this is what a lot of fcs pundits a lot of fcs sports commentators a lot of people who pay attention to the fcs level a lot of fcs journalists reporters have talked about this the FCS level is becoming the JUCO, the new JUCO. The power for the G5s are becoming the new JUCO. Everybody wants to play power four football. Everybody wants to be able to compete at that level with the transfer portal. You can transfer wherever you want as long as your grades are straight. You can, like there's NIL, there's money being paid to these athletes. At this point, if somebody has a good season, it's almost a guarantee if they're at a lower level. Even sometimes at these power four schools, these guys are leaving, having a good season at a lower tier power four, like say Cam Ward is at Wazoo in the Pac-12. Obviously, the Pac-12 doesn't exist anymore. But Cam Ward had a really good season for Wazoo. They weren't the best squad, but you can tell he's a baller. He transfers, goes to the ACC with Miami, where they have a big-name brand, big-time NIL money, big boosters. Like, it's just a bigger brand, a better... It looks better for him. And obviously, he talked about going to the NFL for a second, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, like, guys leaving, especially at the FCS level, at the G5 level. It's so hard for these coaches to be able to build a winning roster, especially like if you're good so say for example james madison they just lost a freshman all-american corner and they had i think they went 11 and 1 last year weren't even eligible to make the sun make the sunbelt championship game they probably would have won it i think they would have won the sunbelt they ended up getting a bowl game because of a technicality like not because they like they made it into a bowl game because they're technically ineligible but there was a loophole in the system i think they they didn't have enough teams so james madison got to go to a bowl i think they ended up winning that bowl nonetheless they lost an all-American freshman corner because of what we're talking about. He's looking for greener grass. He thinks he deserves to play at a higher level. Obviously, James Madison can't compete at the highest level right now because I think they're still going to be in sections coming up in this next season. But tough cookies for them. They lost another corner. They lost their quarterback. Like, all these guys are getting poached by the bigger schools once they have a good season. And that's what Sonny Dykes is, Dykes is referring to. I don't know if this is something he saw at SMU. Obviously, NIL and um, the transfer portal weren't as exaggerated as they are now when he was at SMU. But... I'm sure he probably saw something similar to that. Like, it's hard to keep a good roster when all the big schools are just going to come. Like, look at this NDSU squad. NDSU was not a very good team last year, but they came together late in the season. Obviously, one of their receivers went to the draft. They lost another receiver, Eli Green, the transfer portal. Um, I can't remember who else they lost, but they retained some of their roster. They lost some coaches, but um, I think mostly they lost people to the draft and to the senior, like, to no eligibility left. I don't think they lost a lot of transfer, but they did lose one of their great receivers to the transfer portal. Montana, for example, Junior Bergen was thinking about transferring, thinking about going to the power five, power four level. Potentially he ended up staying. He was able to get what he wanted, but like, these are the things that coach it. Like these are what Sun, this is what Sunny Dice is talking about. Like it's hard to keep a roster together with the transfer portal in NIL era, the FCS and even G fives are becoming what used to be known as juco i mean juco is still a thing but like i don't even know what happens to juco guys now like you have to be balling out of your mind at the juco level to even get a look i feel like because nobody's like that's the last level you're trying to go to first you're looking at the transfer portal next i think you're looking at like well i think you're looking at the transfer portal and whatever you don't get out of the transfer portal you're hoping your incoming freshmen or some juco guys can fill in that gap but i think first for coaches these days when it comes to recruiting is looking at the transfer portal seeing what talent is in the transfer portal no matter what their no matter what their history says
Would you rather get beat 48 to 7 to Georgia in the first round or play a championship? Lashley said. Some say it makes it FCS football, but FCS football thrives for what it is. What saves G5 football is competition. And I think they're talking about the competition related to the Power 4 competition. Like that's what saves the G5s, but they don't compete really with the G5 like with the Power 4s. Like G5s don't really compete at the highest level with them. You don't really see them beat them a lot. They get beat up. It's just like an FCS school. It's like when you see a G5 beat a Power 5 school, it's a big thing. A Power 4 school, it's a big thing because it doesn't happen often. But if you make them their own league and pair them with the FCS, which, like you said, the FCS thrives for what it is. The FCS has a playoff that works really well. It actually just got upgraded when they made 9 through 16 seeded teams 16 seeded teams in the FCS playoff. We're not going get to get, get, go down that right now. But the FCS actually does things right. They play for a championship. People care about it. They have fan bases. Obviously, they're not super big fan bases everywhere, but they have fan bases. They have people who cover the league. They have people who follow it. Like, people care about FCS football for what it is, and they love FCS football for what it is. Division One AA football. FCS football. Now, the G5s, they're kind of tweeners. Like, they're not power fours, and they'll never be able to compete with the power fours, but they don't, they don't identify as FCS schools either because they're not FCS schools. A lot of former FCS schools at that G5 level, but like, it, it's just a middleman. So, I think G5s, FCS, upper FCS, all G5s come to and marry each other and play against each other and make a great championship or even merge what is now the great FCS championship. Like, just bring the FCS level up. What's pro what, Why does everybody have a problem with that FCS title? Like, it's great football. Like, G5s is not doing anything for you. I think there needs to be an FCS G5 merger. I think that's best for college football. I think it would make for some great championship games. Like, I think it'd be amazing. And Ashley and Lashley added that he doesn't think it would necessarily make G5 as attractive as the P4 schools and transfers would still be looking for greener pastures, but that it makes the week to week product more enticing. So we're still referring to how the G5s should split from the P4s, which was Sonny Dyke's original statement from this article that we're pulling from on three. Um, but the bigger the overarching is like, yes, you're still going to get players to get poached. Players are still going to be getting poached. But from a week to week stand base st standpoint, it makes the games more exciting. It makes people want to tap in more, especially with the Jeep. If they make this poll as well, so you get to see where teams are, are ranked at in the, within the G5 and you get to reference that to a game that's coming up this week or a game that's coming up next week, you add a playoff in there. I mean, like, why wouldn't people want to tap into that? People love football, no matter what level it's at. People love FCS football. People love G5 football. People love Power 4 football, obviously. People love NFL football, obviously. People love UFL football. Like, people are going to tap in. It's just how many people are going to tap in. Is there a market for it? And I think that's the biggest question with the G4 split, the G5 splitting from the P4s is, like, is there a market? out here and that's what it's i mean money rules the world so it's all about money obviously this is why we're seeing all the changes what we're seeing in college football as it is it's all about money but it's like is there a market for these g5 teams i think there is but we'll have to wait okay. and see report this is on three as well um former mlb player monty harrison has committed to arkansas football per arkansas recruiting guy at the R ar recruiting guy Harrison was a four-star wide receiver recruit in the 2014 class. So he's been removed from football for about 10 years. Obviously, he's playing baseball. Different, a whole different muscle. You're using completely different muscles to play baseball. But I, I believe if he's really an athlete like that, if he was able to get signed to the MLB and also have a bunch of college football offers as well, this dude's got to be an athlete. So, I mean, this, this is exciting. I, the last time I remember this happening was Brandon Whedon. I think Brandon Whedon had played baseball before he came and played football. I can't 100% remember. Somebody said the other day, one of my friends said the other day that they went on a mission. I thought it was a baseball player, but Brandon Whedon is the last time I saw something like this go on. MLB, Monty Harrison, who spent uh, the last near decade playing professional baseball, including the MLB, committed to Arkansas, according to Richard Davenport. Originally committed to Nebraska in the class of 2014, Harrison was drafted by the Milwaukee Brewers that year in the second round. That's pretty good because there's like thousands of rounds in the MLB. I think they can do as many rounds as they want in the MLB. So to get drafted in the second round of the MLB, like had to be a pretty damn good baseball player. Pretty dang good baseball player. He eventually made it to the big leagues in 2020. So just think about that. That's MLB for you, though. Like, that's the, the minor league system for you. He got drafted in 2014 and didn't make the big leagues until six years later. Six years later. Obviously, he went there. I think he went there right out of high school. So 
Like, he basically went through four years of college and then two years of graduate school before he made it to the big leagues. Like, it, there's not a lot of spots in the big leagues, and it takes a minute for guys to get called up, but kudos to him for getting called up in general. So a lot of guys don't make it. The big leagues in 2020 with the Miami Marlins, playing two seasons with the team. He also played for the Los Angeles Angels in 2022. The 28-year-old Harrison also held offers from Michigan State, Missouri, Indiana, Kansas, among others, when he was a recruit, recruit a decade ago. As a member of the class of 2014, Harrison was a four-star recruit out of Lee Summit, Missouri, West, um, according to On3 Industry Rankings. A weighted average that utilizes all four major recruiting media companies. He, a weighted average that utilizes all four major recruiting media companies. He was the number five overall prospect in the state, the number 50 wide receiver in the class, and the number 297 overall prospect in the class. So pretty good prospect out of the state of Missouri, number five overall prospect in the state, number 50 wide receiver in the nation in his class. So, I mean, middle of the pack guy in terms of net national uh, recognition, but in his state, he was one of the top guys out of his state. And now he's coming back to Arkansas to bring his talents to the University of Arkansas to see what he can do. I know I'm going to be tapped in to see, you know, what he's able to accomplish this year. Very excited to see how that turns out for him. Obviously, he's been a baseball player before this coming back to football. Um, like I said, two different disciplines. You're using different muscles, um, different focus. I Obviously, his hand-eye coordination is probably there. Batting is, I mean, very exciting for him. Very, very exciting for him. Um, we will see how that turns out. Four-star recruit. Now he's been a baseball player for the last 10 years. What does that even look like in terms of, like, changing up your training now? Like, he's doing different training now. Like, when did, and, like, I would love to know when did he make this change? Like, when did he decide that he was going to make this change? When did he decide that, like, okay, I've been a baseball player for all this time. I think it's time to go football. Like, was it that there was no teams calling him for baseball? He had no more baseball opportunities out there. So it's like football is my fallback. And then, like, what does that look like in terms of a head coach and, like, a school committing to a guy like this who hasn't played football in a long time? I mean, it's it's probably hit or miss is if he's going to be successful. So it's like you're honestly taking a chance, taking him on your roster, using a – I don't know. Like, did they use a scholarship? Is he walking on? Like, obviously, this guy has to have a little bit of money in his pocket. He's been in the MLB, but it's like – do they make him walk on? Does he get a scholarship? I don't know. I'd love to talk to the head coach to see how that works. Like, so did he get an off? Did he get a scholarship, or did you guys offer him a scholarship, or is he walking on? Obviously, he's been a pro, but it's been a different sport. So it's like I don't know. There's a lot of questions to be answered, but you guys let me know in the comments, and we will move on. Okay, we are going to be looking at Sam Herder's an early look at his 2024 season FCS preseason top ten. This is Sam Herder. His official at is at Sam Herder FCS. That's at S A M H E R D E R F C S. Go follow him. Go tap in. He does great work for the FCS. He does great work. He does great work. I, I can't say anything else about it. At Sam Herder FCS. Go follow him. Hero Sports is where you can find a lot of his work as well. Hero Sports, Sam Herder, FCS reporter, greatest FCS reporter in the nation. Go follow him. Either way, um, he dropped his 10, his preseason top 10. And we're going to be looking at it. The first net team on this list, which I was kind of surprised about in the United Athletic Conference, is University of Central Arkansas at number 10. Um, one of the things he referenced in his article was Will McIlvain. He returns as a multi-year starting quarterback in two seasons at UCA. He's thrown for 5,000 yards, 42 touchdowns, and 13 interceptions. I think Will McIlvain is originally from UNI. Um I think he had actually received an offer from Montana before he went to um, University of Central Arkansas. I kind of thought he was going to go to Montana. I thought he could have thrived in Montana. But he's had a couple of good seasons at University of Central Arkansas. They're in the United Athletic Conference, who I think, you know, is a def decent conference. Not one of the better conferences in the FCS. Probably a lower-tier conference in the FCS. I think they can be really competitive in that conference. Um, obviously, I don't think they were super good last year. They might have finished, like, third or fourth in that conference last year. They might have finished second. Um, I don't know exactly who, I can't remember exactly who won that conference last year, but obviously UCA coming in at number 10 on Sam Herter's list. He's got high hopes for them. Um, I don't really have very high hopes for them. I hope they're very good, but, um, I, I'd have to look, reevaluate that UAC conference. Let me actually look at it right now. Actually, 
I was correct. Central Arkansas finished second in the United Athletic Conference. Austin P won that conference last year with a 6 and 0 conference record. Central Arkansas was 4 and 2. Southern Utah was also 4 and 2. Eastern Kentucky was also 4 and 2. Tarleton was also 4 and 2. And then right behind those four schools was uh ACU, uh Abilene Christian at 3 and 3. So, honestly, a pretty competitive conference in the UAC. I think they filled 8 teams. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine teams. They filled nine teams. So I'm really excited to see, you know, will Austin P repeat? Will Southern Utah, Eastern Kentucky, Tarleton, will one of those teams step up? Central Arkansas at four and two. But Sam Herter's got them finishing uh, number 10 in his preseason poll. So um, that's very interesting. I, I think, you know, judging off how they did last year, seven and four overall, they did not make the playoffs. I think Austin P lost in the first round of the playoffs last year. So. Um, yeah, very interesting there. Would love to see how they end up. Would love to see how they end up. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Central Arkansas could definitely be a pretty good team to reckon with in, in, uh, in 2024. Next on his list at number nine is Sac State, a Big Sky team. Um, they have Caden Bennett at quarterback as well as um, Conklin, their freshman from last year who's going to be a sophomore this year. And I think Caden Bennett was a sophomore last year. So I think Caden Bennett's only going to be a junior. This whole time, like, I thought Caden Bennett was older than that. Like, I thought he was like a junior or senior this last year. But I think he's only going to be a, a junior next year. So um, this year, this coming into this year. So that's going to be interesting how they play that two quarterback system. Obviously, I think Caden Bennett brings a level of versatility to their offense. He can run, he can pass. He's a good passer, but he can also run the ball, um, get you outside the tackles in terms of those scramble plays and make things happen once the play breaks down. But I think Carson Conklin is, man, he's a damn good thrower over the football. I think he he showed a lot of um, promise last year when he got his opportunities. Um, I think he showed that he has the ability, and they played him quite a bit. I don't know if Caden Bennett was dealing with an injury late in the season, but I remember when they played Montana, he played quite a bit. And I remember the week before, I can't remember exactly who they had played before they played Montana, but Caden Bennett had played quite a bit that week as well. So um, that's a team that obviously Sam Herter's got him at number nine. Sam Herter knows what he's talking about. Um, I definitely think they could be one of the better teams in the country next year. Um, I don't know. What did they finish? I can't remember what they finished in last year. I think they finished eight and five last year. Um, obviously lost to South Dakota in the playoffs. South Dakota, a really good defensive team. That's where Sac State sometimes can lack is on the defensive end. They lose a lot of pieces on their defense too. So that's something that they're going to have to get shored up. I think they return a lot of offensive weapons. Um, Tal Tolliver is somebody, Elijah Tal Tolliver is somebody Sam Herter mentioned in his article. Really good running back. I was really high on him. I think he was honestly dealing with some ankle injuries last year that kind of not, maybe not even ankle injuries, but I think he was just like their third guy. They had some pretty good running backs last year. So Tal Tolliver didn't always get a lot of touches, but I think he's a very versatile guy. Can catch out of the backfield, can make guys miss, can run between the tackles, makes big plays, makes splash plays. Like when he gets the touches, he seems to make plays, but he just didn't always get a lot of touches. So um, Sac State at number nine, not not mad at that one. Um Definitely think they can make some noise. Definitely think they can make some noise. Could be a sleeper in the Big Sky. Obviously, we saw them win three Big Sky championships in a row. So I think to call them a sleeper in the Big Sky is kind of crazy. But, you know, they're definitely going to be making some noise out here. You got Southern Illinois at number eight. Um, really good defensive team, I think Sam Herter said. They averaged, uh, they allowed 16.2 points per game last year, which is actually insane. Um, I think Montana was around like 15. So I think he said they were the number four defense in the FCS last year, which is really, really good for them. Um, they seem to be returning a lot of uh, weapons, but one thing they're not returning is a quarterback. Uh, I mean, they may be returning a quarterback, but they have a quarterback spot is up for grabs, which is being battled for by DJ Williams, um, who was the 2021 OVC freshman of the year. I don't know who their other quarterback who is going to be battling for that spot, but I'm sure that Murray State transfer DJ Williams is probably leading for that spot to get that spot. i um, not sure what else... Um, not sure what other quarterbacks they have on their roster besides the Murray State transfer. Um, I'm not very keyed into Southern Illinois all the time. Um, I know they were a really good team last year. I know they beat, uh, what is it, Northern Illinois. Also, they beat, um, I'm trying to remember. He mentioned it in the article. But I, they, they beat some pretty good teams last year. I think they might have finished 8-5 and five last year as well. Um, they were a pretty good team last year. 
Obviously, they made it to the playoffs. They lost to Idaho in a close one, 20-17. Um, then Idaho ended up losing that next week to Albany. But, you know, Southern Illinois, good te- good squad. Um, playing the NVFC, playing in a really tough conference. Obviously, you had South Dakota last year. You had North Dakota last year. North Dakota State wasn't one of the better teams. But then you have you still have to play them. You have North uh, South Dakota State. Like, all those Dakota schools are usually always good. And then you got Southern Illinois. They just lost Missouri State. So, I don't know if they choose to add somebody in the MVFC or if they just keep it to where it is I, I think they got like 12 or 13 in the MVFC so minus that whatever it is 12 13 now 11 or 12 uh, but you know interesting to see um Southern Illinois at eight definitely Idaho at number seven um they lose a lot I've talked about this a lot Anthony Woods the running back gone Hayden Hatton gone to the draft now on the Seahawks um quarterback gosh why am I McCoy Giovanni McCoy gone um, I don't even know where Giovanni McCoy ended up. I can't remember where he ended up, but I know their running back ended up at Utah. Uh, Giovanni McCoy, not sure where he ended up. I honestly need to check in on that. But they have another quarterback, the young quarterback, Lane. Um, should be pretty good this year. Jack Lane. I remember he played against Idaho State and lit them up a week before. That might have been the last game of the season, but he lit it up. Um, threw the ball all over the place. I think he threw for like four touchdowns in that game. I don't think he had a ton of yards, but was dotting them up in the air. Also, another piece that they lost was Jermaine Jackson. So losing two really good receivers, um, losing their quarterback, obviously replacing him with a with a freshman, soon to be sophomore. Or I don't know if he actually retained his redshirt last year. I don't remember. I don't know what year this quarterback was. But QB Jack Lane, young guy, underclassman t- uh, player. Defensively, I think was. One of the strengths for Idaho, they were able to, I mean, they play a lot of ball control football, so it's hard to say if it's like their defense or if it's just they're not allowing the other team to get the ball because, you know, sometimes I think their defense could be susceptible to big plays, but I think they played fairly well last year. I I would say their defense played fairly well last year. They fall at number seven on Sam Herter's list. Um, That's the second Big Sky team in here now. Um yeah, I think they I think they could be pretty good in 2024. Um, I obviously have said they're not my sleeper in in the Big Sky, but I think Idaho could definitely win the Big Sky in 2024. If any year was a good time for them to win the Big Sky, it's this year. They don't play. They, I don't think they play anybody particularly really good in the conference. I think they play Montana State, but I don't. They don't play Montana. I don't think they play SAC or UC Davis. Like I think they have a pretty favorable schedule this year, which you know could help them out in terms of winning the conference. I, I think it really helps them out in terms of winning the conference. So they're no, no surprise to see them at seven. Their schedule is very healthy. They could. They should be in the top 10, 15 all season long. If excuse me, if they play well, you know, if they play the way they should. Now, if they lay an egg and you know kick the ball around a lot this year, they they may not. But that. Seventh preseason ranking is no surprise to me. Villanova at number six, really good defensive team in 2023. I think they were around that top five, top ten defensively all year last year. They're one of the teams who was able to hold um, South Dakota State to a lower total. Obviously, they lost in the playoffs. Um, I think that was the quarterfinals that they played South Dakota State, and they lost. Yeah, because South Dakota State played Albany. So they played uh, Villanova in the quarterfinals and Villanova lost. But they, you know, obviously it was a windy game. They're playing in South Dakota outdoors. Only Dakota school without an indoor stadium, which is funny in itself. But playing outdoors on that checkered field, um, checkered end zones at least. And um, Villanova played them pretty toughly throughout the game. The wind was a big factor, I think, in terms of throwing the ball um, in the air. But still, Villanova was able to hold them to a to a low total and uh you know South Dakota State didn't didn't roll them but Villanova had a really strong defense in 2023 they're returning their quarterback in 2024 um they're t- returning an all, uh, a couple of linemen um and they're returning a, a receiver as well so you know they should be pretty good I, I I don't know too much about Villanova and the CAA I think they shared the title last year with Richmond and uh, I always blank Albany, Albany, Richmond, and uh, Villanova. I think all shared that CAA title. They had quite a few playoff teams, though. They had Richmond, Villanova, um, Richmond, Villanova, Albany, and then they had Delaware. I think I'm missing one as well. I think they had another team make the playoff. But CAA, obviously, always a good conference. The biggest conference with 16 teams. Um, I think they have 16. Um, I think they might be adding North Carolina A&T. Either they added them last year or they're adding them this year. But I know North Carolina A&T, I believe, is in the CAA. I think Hampton might be in the CAA this year as well. Don't quote me on that. But the CAA is a really big conference. They play really good football. Sam Herter's got them at six in his preseason poll. Um, Yeah, 
What do you guys think about that? South Dakota coming in at number five. USD had a really good year last year, 10 and three. I actually did a breakdown on one of their freshman DNs who I think could be primed for a breakout season. McKees Grace, um, really good young player. Had, I think, five sacks last year, balled out. Um, is looking to be better this year. But they had a really good defense last year. That's what I think they hung their hat on. They had a corner. I don't know if their corner ended up getting drafted, but they had a really good corner who um, was highly projected. I'm sure he's on an NFL roster right now, going through mini camp, all of that good stuff, OTAs. Um, yeah, man, they, they beat, I think they beat uh, North Dakota State last year. So they might have beat, they might have beat North Dakota State in the regular season, but they did not beat North Dakota State in the playoffs. They got beat down by North Dakota State in the playoffs, 45 to 17. Um, that's obviously the, 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 thing that hangs over everybody's head in that MVFC conference is North Dakota State. They've run the conference for a long time. They've run the FCS for a long time. I don't know why I'm just saying conference. They've run the league, the division for a long time. And uh, obviously South Dakota sees them more than anybody rather than South Dakota, other than South Dakota State, North Dakota, like they see them all the time. And to see them in the playoffs, they ran into them. And, you know, at that point, North Dakota State was rolling on all cylinders, fire, firing on all cylinders. I mean, North Dakota State was very close to making it to the Natty. Um, they ran into Montana, but South Dakota State was a good outfit in 2023. Um, they beat South State, who was also on this list in the playoffs. They had beat them um, pretty handedly in the second round of the playoffs in South Dakota. I, I can't, Vermilion, I think is where they play in that new indoor, not even new, renovated indoor stadium. But South Dakota, no surprise to see them on here. Number five on the list. They probably finished top 10, top 15 in the final poll last year. But um, pretty good squad right there. Montana State coming in at number four. Obviously, we know Tommy Malott, uh, Brody Greeby, their other D end. Caden Eden, the fourth, is also another player to watch. They have their um, PFF leading tackle, Marcus Weir, returning as well. And then they have a bunch of linemen with starting experience returning as well. So um, pretty good squad out of Montana State. I think the biggest thing for Montana State will be Tommy Malott staying healthy. Um, I think, I mean, I don't think his injury really hurt them against North Dakota State. They honestly probably should have won that game had they made that PAT. We'll see. We, I mean, We'll never know because the PAT got blocked, and that was their biggest problem. And it, it 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 typified their season for that to happen at that moment in the game because that was their problem all year. Obviously, kickers not making kicks was the problem instead of them getting blocked. But, I mean, for them to have a kick get blocked to end their season is just very on brand for what on par for what that season was last year. Now, if they get that settled up, I think the biggest thing for them is to protect Tommy Malat. He is the gold. He is what is going to take you guys as far as you guys are going to go. If he's healthy, he can take y'all very far. If he's hurt, your season might be pretty rough. I, I don't know. He's the, he's the whole key. Offensively, he's the key because he makes the de defense react to him. He can run. He can throw. But that triple zone read option is what he's dangerous in, where he has the option to hand it, where he has the option to pull it and run it. He has the option to pull it and pass it to the tight end in the flat like or receiver in the flat, whoever's in the flat. Like That is the bread and butter of their offense. That is the bread and butter of what makes Tommy Malott so dangerous to me. I would not be running him on those power quarterback runs a lot. That is why you had Sean Chambers, who was also hurt last year. Um, I don't know. Tommy Malott needs to be used in the run game very much less or very smarter on the edge, if anything, if you're using him in the run game. Like, protect him, and you guys can go very far. Uh, Montana State coming in at number four on this list. I think that's no surprise. They they returned some good players on defense. They have a receiver who actually didn't get to play last year, Lanyata Alexander, who had to sit out a year because of transfer rules, which probably wouldn't stand this year. Um, it's honestly ridiculous that he had to sit out last year, but he's going to be up this year, and it's going to be very exciting to see what he's able to accomplish Accomplish. But um, yeah, Montana State at number four. Going to be exciting to see what Montana State as a whole is going to be able to accomplish. Them number four at the preseason poll. Um, going to be a pretty good, should be a pretty good squad in 2024. Should be a pretty pretty good squad, I, I hope. For the big sky's sake, I hope they're good in 2024. Next coming in, you got Montana at number three. Obviously, they're returning all, the, the big question for Montana is the quarterback position. The big question for Montana coming into 2024 is the quarterback position. Who is going to be throwing the ball around for them? Um, what are they going to look like on that side of the football? That is the big question that everybody has. Um, they got the receivers. They got the running backs. All three of their running backs look really good. Xavier, um, 
Xavier obviously moving a receiver. What is he going to look like a receiver? That adds another weapon. You got Cole Grossman coming back. Like, they got a lot of weapons offensively, but who's going to be throwing them the football? Is it going to be Logan Fife? Is it going to be a Kiali Ayat? Like, who, who, who does that? Then on the defensive side of things, I've said it. You lost Kale Edwards now, and now you've also lost Gubb, Alex Gubner. Now, Kale Edwards wasn't a huge contrib. Like, he, I think he had four sacks last year, maybe five sacks last year, but he split time. He wasn't always the number one guy. You got Hayden Harris. You got uh, Pat Hayden, who's now the D tackle, uh, probably that zero technique in the middle of that defense. You got Riley Wilson. You got some pieces on the back end, Ryder Meyer. You have Trevor Gradney, obviously. You got a lot of pieces on the defense. What is it going to look like? Linebacker position is another good question, big question mark. But D tackle and linebacker is what it comes down to me for the Montana State, Montana defense. But Montana should be pretty good. I'm not surprised to see them at number three. That's now, I think, the fourth Big Sky team in here. What is that? Montana, Montana State, Idaho. And Sex State, yeah, so now the fourth Big uh, big Sky team in there. And then, yeah, so Montana, I think they're going to be pretty good. Third in the preseason poll is no surprise to me. I think, obviously, the preseason poll is voted on. I think there's a media one and a coaches one. So this is what Sam predicts it to be. Um, I think Montana should be right around there. You know, they return a lot of pieces. Offensive line should be pretty good. Offensive weapons are obviously good. Defensive, you got defensive weapons. I mean, I don't know if they're supposed to be called weapons, but you have guys on defense who make plays. And uh, we'll see how they're able to put it together. They got some some losing a coach and Coach Bradford to the NFL. But, you know, you got Tim Houck, who has a ton of experience splitting that with Coach Cooper, I believe, on the defensive end of things. But it's going to be good. Got Scott Linehan coming in to help Coach Pease potentially. I think Coach Pease did a great job calling the offense last year. But we'll see what it looks like this year. It's going to be exciting. I'm excited to see what it all looks like. I'm excited. Number two, NDSU who I think is going to be the team to beat in 24. I've said it all offseason, and I will continue to say it. NDSU is going to be a problem. Cam Miller was on a heater towards the end of the season. Obviously, he ran into a buzzsaw, which was Montana in Montana, in Wagriz, against that Montana defense. I mean, it, it's hard. It's hard to win in Montana. It's hard to win in Wagriz Stadium. But you got Cam Miller, Cole Payton, their other quarterback, the running quarterback who made some plays against Montana, made some plays against South Dakota, made plays all year. He's a problem. He's a problem. Cam Miller with his arm is a problem. Cole Payton with his legs is a problem. Cole Wisnowski, who I think is honestly ranked like top 150 in, on some draft boards going in the next season, had eight interceptions last year at the safety position, is an absolute ball hawk, is returning to North Dakota State to make plays once again. I'm sure we'll see him on Sunday making plays, picking off passes. Um, he, he's a great player. He's a great, great player. He returns for that defense. They also have another D lineman returning who played a lot of snaps last year, led the league, led the nation, I think, in fumble recovery. So they got some pieces defensively, got some pieces offensively that are returning. Um, I think they're going to be a good outfit. They just lost their receiver, Eli Green, to transfer. Um, we will see where he ends up. I know he probably should be getting a lot of P5 FBS attention from a lot of schools at the FBS level, P4 level. Um, we'll see where he lands at, but, you know, um, North Dakota State, no surprise to see them on there. I think they're going to be the team to beat. Uh, Sam Herter disagrees with me, though, because obviously the number one squad in the preseason poll is going to be the back-to-back -back national champions, who Sam says is returning nearly 30 seniors, which is absolutely ridiculous. 30 seniors, that's a lot. Now, what level of experience those seniors have is yet to be determined, but 30 seniors nonetheless is a lot. They have their quarterback coming back, Mark Gronowski, Back-to-back -back national champion, 37-3 and as a starter. Sam likes to point out that they lost one game because he got hurt in 2021 to Sam Houston State. He might be a three-time national champion had that not happened. I am one who fully believes South Dakota State because that was a tight game in itself. Sam Houston State scored on a last-minute touch. Like, that game was great. First off, that 2021 national championship against South Dakota State and Sam Houston State was a freaking great game. I'm mad Montana didn't play that year. Obviously, that would have been me. I would have been playing that year. I wish the Big Sky would have played in that spring. Um, but, man, that was a great national championship game. S Mark Gronowski might be a three-time national champion had that not happened, had he not got hurt. I think he hurt his knee in that game, but, like, sheesh. <laughs> what a game. Um, what a career it's been for Mark Gronowski. Obviously, he's the, the main guy you think of when you think about that team. Um, they got some offensive line return, two starters, and Evan Bernstein, Bernstein and Gus Miller. Um, 
FCS Center, the Remington Award winner. Um, they got a transfer, Sam Hagen, um, guard. He started on a good North Dakota. I think they just got him like a couple weeks ago. Started on North Dakota's line last year. So um, good player out of him. But obviously, I think it's Mark Gronowski is the key. Um, I think they have a lot to replace with the Yankee brothers leaving. They had a tight end leave as well. So that like they had, Isaiah Davis, like offensively, the weapons department, like receiver, running back, tight end. They got some answers. They got some questions to answer. I think defensively, they lost defensive weapons too. Like they lost a lot of players. And that's my thing is like Sam wants to point to the seniors that they're bringing up, which I respect. But how much experience do those seniors have? And also, what about the weapons offensively? You're losing two receivers. You're losing a tight end. You lost your all-American do-everything running back. Defensively, lose some linebackers. Lose some defensive backs. I think they might have lost some safeties. I don't know. But they're losing pieces all over the place. They return pieces, but they're losing pieces. So what are they going to look like? I don't think they're going to be the best team in the MVFC. Obviously, number one in the preseason poll. So this is predicting where teams will be ranked in the preseason before any games have been played. So I'm. this is all just me talking Talking to myself, really. But, like, I don't know. What do you guys think about all this? What do you guys think about where these teams are ranked? Let's go back down it. You got UCA at 10, Sac State, Central Arkansas at 10, Sac State at 9, Southern Illinois at 8, Idaho at 7, Villanova at 6, South Dakota at 5, Montana State at 4, Montana at 3, North Dakota State at 2, and South Dakota State at 1. What do you guys think about where these pre teams, Sam thinks these teams will be ranked in the preseason? I give you my thoughts. What do you guys think? We will move on. Boise State's Spencer Danielson announced incoming freshmen are banned from taking NIL money their first season. If you're looking for the easy way and you're looking for a handout, don't come to Boise State. <laughs> Boise State head football coach Spencer Danielson made waves on Wednesday when it was shared that freshmen for the Broncos apparently might not be getting NIL deals funneled through the program's associated collective in a since clarified report. It was quickly clar quickly clarified that Danielson wasn't putting a strict embargo in place on freshmen earning via NIL deals, but that the program would not be promising or offering NIL deals to recruits or first year players. So basically, we're not gonna stop you from getting NIL deals. If businesses come to you, or if you go to businesses and you guys can work out a deal and you can get some money in your pocket, good. But we're not, and our NIL collective is not gonna be looking for deals for you. And we're not gonna be using that to recruit you to our schools we want you to come we want to build a culture and that's something he's going to reference while freshmen particularly not high profile recruits for profile former recruits likely earn less and average than upperclassmen at most programs such a public announcement is unheard of for obvious reasons as a notion that a program is willing to pay play ball in nil's prime mo for schools recruiting against them so basically other mountain west schools can see this and be like look why would you go to boise state they're not going to pay you any nil money they're not going to help you get any NIL deals. You come with us, we'll get you money in your pocket right now. We'll get you an NIL deal right now. We'll get you, our collective can get you set up right now. Come play for us and not at Boise State. Come over to Bad Boy. Or nah, leave Bad Boy. Come over, to, I can't even remember. Whatever. You guys know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. They could use this against Boise State and the coach probably doesn't care. Danielson, speaking to Broncos supporters on Wednesday, indicated his desire was to build a culture where players are committed to the program and each other and not chasing a payout. So basically, come for Boise State. Come for the education. Come for the tradition, which is not what you see a lot these days. And I don't know how this is going to work out for him. But he's telling these players, come for the tradition. Come for Boise State. Come for the education. Come for the, the culture. Come for the camaraderie. Don't come for the NIL. The NIL will come. Keep ball, ball. I don't know if this is a good recruiting strategy. I don't know if this is going to appeal for him. We'll be interested to see how Boise State is this year. But to each their own. If this works out for you, good for you. I'll be happy for you. I'll be excited for your program. I'll be happy for your players. But I don't know if this is the route I would go down if I was in his position. I don't know. I don't know. I probably wouldn't. But that's probably why I'm not a college football coach. So, you know, it is what it is. We will move on. Let me know what you guys think about those comments. Do you guys think it'll work out for Boise State? Or do you guys think he's towing a dangerous line right there? Let me know, and we will move on. College football rosters could be trimmed to 85 to 95 players under new proposal. Now, this is interesting, and this is something that I thought about when I first heard about the NIL rules, when I first heard about like the revenue, the new revenue structure that could potentially be coming down on the NCAA 
particularly the Power Fives, this could mean new roster structure. Let's read it. Roster sizes in college football could be significantly reduced as a part of new proposal related to athlete athlete compensation so if these players become employees of the university if they're getting paid out money from the athletic department or through these third party nil departments most likely the athletic department though if that is the new change that we see um roster sizes got to be cut roster sizes have to be cut Per Yahoo Sports' Ross Dellinger, the proposal being considered by power conference leaders would limit rosters to potentially as few as 85 to 95 players. Now, I think most rosters sit around 100, 105, maybe 110, 150. I, I, I don't know. I think they're usually around like 105 to 115 players, maybe even 120. If this gets trimmed now, less walk-ons, probably bringing in less freshmen, like recruiting classes are going to be much smaller. Like it's, it's going to make less opportunities for everybody involved. Dellinger noted the concept was brought up as a part of what could be a sweeping and historic transformation within college sports based on settlement agreements for the three antitrust lawsuits against the NCAA. Any settlement of these cases, House, Hubert, and Carter, is expected to feature as much as $2.9 billion in back damages for former players, a future revenue sharing model with current athletes, and an overhaul of the NCAA scholarship and roster structure, Dellinger wrote. According to Dellinger, settlement talks are deep enough that college executives and NCAA leaders are socializing plans of a new compensation model that could include schools distributing more than $20 million annually to athletes beginning in 2025. So this could be a change that we see as soon as 2025. Five, 20 million dollars to athletes on a given power four campus dispersed out the quarterback offensive line probably getting a healthy share of that big star players like I, that's the next thing is like i talked about this last week does this now mean that general managers are going to be hired at the college level to manage rosters to manage payout distribution like does the athletic director handle that like an athletic director is handling a whole athletic department so you need another person to handle what is now going to be your salary cap. You're going to like, because the head coach that probably doesn't want to deal with that. They probably do like, unless they're, I don't know. These head coaches didn't sign up to be NFL head coaches. They signed up to be college coaches because these are some of the problems that they didn't want to have to deal with. So it's like, I don't know. I don't know. And, and that might not 100% be true. Maybe some of these coaches do envision being NFL coaches one day. They're just not there yet. But like, that's something at the college level that used to not have to deal with. Now that's something that you're going to have to deal with. What looks like to be 2025 going forward. Who knows? Under the current rules, there isn't a hard cap on how many players a football team can have rostered. No more than 70 players are allowed to appear in a game. FCS teams are limited to 85 full scholarship players per year. FCS programs are allowed up to 63 full scholarship players annually. A typical FBS roster could feature 115 or more players in a given year. Like I said, the new rule would essentially be limiting the number of walk-ons a team could keep rostered. So, man, after those 85 scholarship players, obviously everybody else is rostered. Basically, this is just cutting out all the, the walk-on players. Or everybody after that, everybody else is walk-ons. Basically, this is limiting how many walk-ons a team can have. Because there's still going to be the 85 scholarship players. But, I mean, there might just only be 85 scholarship players. Like, what? That would be crazy. That would suck for all these guys who get these walk-on opportunities. Obviously, that would push them down to the G5 level. Or if the G5 adopts this model as well, obviously, that would push them down to the FCS level. Or, I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's just going to be a trickle-down effect. There's going to be less opportunities at the upper level, which pushes these guys down to the G5, which pushes G5 guys down to the FCS, which pushes FCS guys down to the D2, which, like, would this make for better football product on the field? That's my question. Would this make for a better football product on the field? You're basically trickling down all the, comp all the uh, talent down a level, down a level, down a level, down a level. So then what does that look like for the upper tier levels, for the G5, for the P4s, for the FCS levels? Like, what does that look like at that level? What does the competition look like? What Like, I don't know. That's something we're going to have to see. Something we're going to have to see. Um, Dellinger did note one potentially impactful piece of the proposal could be scholarship restrictions by permitting schools to expand financial aid to the entirety of a sports roster positions. Scholarship restrictions by permitting schools to expand financial aid to the entirety of a sports roster positions. 
Not sure what that means. This would allow for other sports to potentially receive more full scholarships. The example Dylan's recited was a base was baseball, in which current NCAA rules allow for 11.7 scholarships per year. The new model could distribute full scholarships to all 32 roster spots on a team if the school chooses to do so. Interesting. This would allow for sports to potentially receive more full scholarships. Than, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so we're all good there. Man, I don't, I don't know what to think about this. I have no idea what to think about this. I think this is very exciting. Obviously, this is talking about the revenue structure that could be coming, salary cap that could be coming. I mean, I think I've already made all of my comments on this topic, but just like less walk-on spots. That's crazy. That's crazy, and that sucks for guys. Like, where do those guys now go? Like, I know a lot of times walk-ons are guys that have envisioned playing for a certain university, a hometown university their whole life. And, you know, eventually they don't get any offers anywhere else. So it's like, I'm going to go play for this school. This is the school I wanted to play for. I'm going to play for them. Um, what does that, I mean, what does that look like? What does that look like going forward now? 85, 95 roster spots, most likely 10 to no. If they do 85, that's no roster. That's no walk-on spots. If they do 95 roster, like that's only 10 roster walk-on spots. Like walk-on spots are going to become like, if you're a walk-on, like, it's going to be like the NFL because it's like if you're a practice squad guy, obviously you made the the team like to a, to to an extent you made the team. But it's like your spot is not guaranteed ever. If you're not performing, if you're not up to snuff, like they're going to let you go because it's like we can bring somebody else on to be our practice squad guy other than let you just take another spot making 250, 300,000 this year like we don't need that. Like Man, I don't know. It's going to be making it more like professional football. Salary cap, obviously, is making it more like professional football. I mean, the the NCAA is turning into a professional league before our very eyes. What do you guys think about this? Do you guys think it's bad for walk-ons? Like, do you guys feel sorry for walk-ons? Or do you guys think this is a good instrumental change for college football? What do you guys think? Let me know. And we will move on. Missouri State is moving to Conference USA. Now, I saw a lot of people online talking about this. Obviously, Missouri State has not been super competitive at the FCS level. I don't think they've ever won a national championship. I don't think they've ever even made the national championship game. But they are joining an already weak, weakened FBS conference. The Conference conference USA is not very strong. Let's just call it what it is. They're not very strong. There's not a lot of top-tier teams. There's a lot of former FCS teams in that conference, but let me read you a little bit about the article that they released. Missouri State University has accepted an invitation to join Conference USA as a full league member. That means I think all their sports will be playing in Conference USA. Effective July 1, 2025, league and university officials announced the move uh, on Friday morning, May 10th. The announcement will officially place Missouri State University in the NCAA's exclusive Division I FBS Football Bowl Subdivision for the first time. Missouri State will become the 12th full-time member of Conference USA, which is comprised of the following universities. Florida or Florida International University. I think they might have used to they might have been FCS at one point in time. Jackson State University used to be FCS. Liberty University used to be FCS. Louisiana Tech University, I think they used to be FCS. Middle Tennessee State University, not so sure about them. New Mexico State University, not so sure about them. Sam Houston State University won an FCS National Championship in 2021. It's COVID year. University of Texas El Paso, not sure if they used to be FCS, but University of Texas El Paso, Western Kentucky used to be FCS. Kennesaw State University, I think they moved up like two years ago, a year ago. University of Delaware was FCS last year, just moved up this year. I don't even know if they're going to be, I think they're joining July, so they're not even joining. Delaware will still be FCS this year. They're not joining until 2025, and Kennesaw is joining this year, so they were FCS last year. They might have been limbo last year. Delaware might be limbo this year, but a um, couple teams who will be joining in a couple of years. But, I mean, man, Missouri State, this is interesting, man. Like, I, I don't know... I want to know what the what the discussion is with athletic departments. Like, do they think it will reinvigorate your fan base? Like, do you think it'll bring more money in for you guys? Like, what is the allure for a team to move up to Conference USA when you haven't been very competitive at the FCS level as it is? So you're just going to move up another level, hopefully that hoping that you can get better recruits, hoping that, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, are you able to, like, 
what does NIL look like at a university like this? Like, how much NIL are you paying out to players? Like, what is, I don't know what the structure looks like at a Missouri State, who is a bottom tier Missouri Valley school, and most likely is going to be a bottom tier Conference USA school, at least in the first, in the beginning. They, I mean, I got to believe they're not going to move up like James Madison. James Madison was an upper tier FCS school, moved up to the Sun Belt and dominated immediately. But that's because they already had the facilities. They already had the finances. They already had the recruits. They had a bunch of G5 recruits, FBS recruits as it is. Like, they were a G5 power four school playing at the FCS level. Missouri State was a lower tier FCS school playing at the FCS level, now moving up to the G5 level. I mean, I don't I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work out for them. I don't know if that's going to work out for them. I think, I mean, I think Liberty has been moved up for some time now, maybe close to 10 years. Liberty has been moved up to the FBS level. And I think we just saw one of their better seasons this year when they went, I think they might've went undefeated before they lost towards the end of the season. But Liberty was a really good outfit in 2020. 2023 and i think that was one of their first seasons that they've been really that good somebody correct me in the comments if i'm wrong but i don't know how this is going to end up for missouri state i don't i don't have a lot of i don't i don't i don't have a lot of promise for what they're going to look like once they finally move up in 2025 but um we're seeing a lot of changes in college football obviously i just went down the line of all the changes we're seeing in college football you guys let me know in the comments what you guys think about all of these changes that are happening at the college football level um Honestly, it's crazy. Leave me a comment. Please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about all of this. That is going to conclude my video for this week. I did not ask for subscriber questions. I will be on top of it next week. Uh, I appreciate you guys for continuing to tap in. College football season is fast approaching. We are in May. It's going to be June before we know it. Then it'll be July. Then it'll be August. And then we'll be playing football. So, you know, it's very exciting. Very exciting. Big Sky football coming fast, FCS football coming fast, FBS football coming fast, the 12th team playoff is coming fast, everything is coming fast, and there's a lot of changes still, I'm sure that are going to happen before the start of the season, so make sure you guys leave me a like, leave me a comment, subscribe to the channel, thank you guys for tapping in, and I will catch you guys next week.